Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, we're really glad that you're here today, and uh, we're really glad for those who are watching online as well. Uh, we just got a couple little minor announcements I want to share with you. Obviously, um, normally on the video announcements, I'd encourage you to check in and like us on Facebook. It's a great way of letting your friends and family know that you love it here and you want them to join us. So actually inviting them to join you at church, crazy thing to do, but I know. But, you know, it's a wonderful thing if they're able to come, if they're willing to come, or just watch us online. We appreciate all the people who are participating in that way. Um, also, uh, for those who may be coming again for the first time in a long time, you may notice things are a little bit different. Our services are shorter. Also, our offering time doesn't happen during the service, but on your way out, there are boxes uh, at the entrances, and make sure you make use of those. And if you're uh, watching online, you can always give online, too, at wsbchurch.com. Um, you can always do that, and if you forgot your checkbook today, you can always do that that way, too. Um, otherwise, uh, I want to remind you, too, of the missions event that's tonight. Um, KT Neville will be sharing a little bit about what God has been doing in and through her at 3 p.m. Uh, we'll be out on the lawn out here. I think it's going to be a beautiful night for it. So I hope you come on out for that and uh, just are encouraged by uh, what God is doing in the world right now. He's doing some great stuff, even though we can't quite see it sometimes right where we are. Um, other than that, I also want to remind you of our... Uh, we had some visiting missionaries right here. We have uh, Brendan and Kayla Wurzel. They are here um, as uh, they were ministers with the Czech Republic, and they are connected to Josiah Venture, and they've been doing that for like about a year now, so yeah. Um, and I encourage you to get a chance uh, after service, put on your mask and go talk to them and, and, and find out what's going on with them and um, continue to be praying and uh, just supporting our, our missionaries in prayer, lifting them up because... Right now is a very difficult time with COVID and various other things. And then uh, every missionary, as a human being, just like you and me, has stuff going on in their life. And they need your prayer. They need your support in that way that the mission might continue to go forward, that the gospel would reach all nations. Um, because we know that after it reaches all nations, the end will come and Jesus will return. We look forward to that. So that's our, that's our, our dream and our goal and our hope. Um, also, just one last thing, uh, I want to remind you that on the 30th, that's coming faster than you know, on the 30th, we're having our baptisms at Waco, uh, so, or Waco, or however you want to say it, I don't care anymore. Um, <laughs> baptisms at the beach, you're welcome to come and join us for that. Um, it's going to be at 1230 on the 30th. All you got to do to come in, if you don't have a pass, is show them uh, your sermon outline and, and let them know, or just... Honestly, just tell them that you're with us, um, and they'll know, and, and you're welcome to come on in. If you do plan on staying a little bit longer, they would ask that you'd buy a day pass um, if you plan on hanging out at the beach after the baptisms for a while. But it's going to be a great celebration. I know we have one for a certain candidate, but if you've been putting off getting baptized for a while, don't wait any longer. There's no reason to wait. Um, it's a great step of obedience to Christ and his command. It is his command, by the way that says we should be baptized. And so we want to follow in that and in his example in getting baptized and demonstrating complete obedience to the Father. So in all that in mind, our complete obedience of our Savior and all that he did uh, for us and the life that he gave so that we can have new life, let's go to him in prayer and let's worship him this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your complete obedience, Lord Jesus, that you went to the cross for us. You, you, not only that, but you lived among us. You taught us how we should live in relation to God. And then you made the way. You became the way. And this morning we celebrate that as those who have trusted the way. Lord, thank you for forgiveness of sins and knowledge that we will spend eternity with you based upon what you've done, not based upon what we've done. And Lord, let that inspire us and fuel our daily life. Let that drive us towards serving, serving one another and serving you. And God, we pray for those who have been so driven that they have been compelled to be missionaries all around the world, uh, stretching themselves and, and reaching other cultures. And Lord, we pray for their ministries. We pray for your hand to be upon them, that you would use them in mighty, powerful ways, and that the gospel would spread to the whole world that all would have an opportunity, all would hear, and, Lord, that so many more would come to believe. Lord, we pray that not just for people on the other side of the globe, but even for people who live right next door to us who need you so desperately. Lord, there's so many in need all around us, 
especially thanks to the pandemic and various other life circumstances. We know that you know their deepest needs. And Lord, for what we do know of the needs of our neighbors, our friends, our family, um, Lord, will you open our eyes and our hearts to love and to care for them, to be there for them, even though this is a very difficult time to be so. Lord, help us to reach beyond our comfort zone into this lost, dark, sinful, fallen, hurting world that needs you so desperately, Lord, that aches for your redemption. Lord, we all do. We long for you to come, but right now we know that you are here among us, that your presence is here, and so we bow our knees here and now, and we recognize your lordship over our lives, and we worship you with all that we are because of your mighty, awesome, and powerful name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Those of you sitting in here with us and those watching online, we're glad you're all with us today. Um, one of the, the passages we're going to be looking at today, it talks about faith and works or deeds. And, and faith, trusting. You know, we say we have faith in Jesus. We trust that God's going to do what he says he's going to do. And deeds or works, depending on the translation, is actually doing something. And sometimes when we read this, uh, when you're listening today, it can be confusing because we know, we're told that all you need is faith in Jesus. That's what you need to get to heaven. You cannot do anything to earn your way to heaven. And then here, James is saying what well, we also need deeds. Well, I want you to picture this. Picture yourself in a rowboat. I, I didn't bring one with me because I thought that'd be kind of awkward to try and, and show for an object lesson. But picture yourself in a rowboat, okay? Now, a rowboat does not have an engine. You need oars to make it move, okay? So you're in a rowboat. You're safe. That's your faith. You have faith in Jesus. You're safe sitting in your rowboat. But without the oars of deeds or works, you're not going to go anywhere. You're just going to sit there and be safe. And that's not what God wants us to do. God wants us to move forward. He wants us to help people. He wants us to do things for others. Those are the works. Those are the deeds that he's talking about. So just keep that image in your head. If, you, if, if Pastor Jim says something in the sermon that maybe confuses you, think about it that way. Remember that rowboat and how, yes, you can have faith and you have faith in Jesus and that will get you to heaven. But God wants us to do more than just sit in our faith. He wants us to do deeds and works to be kind to those around us. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for your word and everything that you give us each day. We thank you for your son. We just pray that you help us to remember that while, yes, having faith, we will get to see you in heaven one day, but, but you want more than us to just sit in our faith. You want us to do. You want us to, to be, to be kind, to be helpful, to, to um, help people that need something from us. And we just pray that you help us to remember that each day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are able, would you stand and join us in worship this morning?
So if you've, you've noticed that this series on James, um, Jim has been just referring to faith, faith in God. And we know that we can trust him and have faith because he has proven himself. He, is our pro- he keeps his promises. So we're going to sing that this morning that he can make a way. We just have to, you know, just follow after him. He, he keeps his promises. He brings light into the darkness. Um, so this song, it's been on the radio, I know, and we've been singing it here and there with, you know, at home video streams and in person. So just, it's pretty easy. Just sort of sing these words out and declare your trust in God. Stop working, way maker, miracle worker, promise. 
praise you for for being trustworthy for being faithful for always keeping your promises and so God would you just challenge that with us this morning to to follow you in faith because we know that that you are good and you are faithful and uh, just lead us in your way Lord Um, just please teach us this morning challenge us encourage us um, with your words with your word And it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This might seem like a crazy question because you're here, but do you believe in God? (laughs) I mean, do you truly believe in God? And again, I assume that you do because you're here, or at least you're seeking answers. You're wanting to learn more about him. And if you are looking for that, then I I believe you're in the right place. Because we want to help you develop authentic faith. Real, living, active, true to Scripture, true to God's reality faith. And um, there are many things in this world that look a lot like authentic faith. You know, they, they have the basic image, but at the same time, some of them are hollow or empty or, or a little bit deceiving. For instance, there's cultural faith. It's that kind of faith that you've probably inherited that you may have not even be aware of that you uh, drew in by osmosis. A lot of people say, I'm a Christian because I grew up in church, because my grandparents are Christian, thus I am a Christian, or I hang out with Christians, so yeah, I'm, I, I do that on Sunday morning every, every week, so I'm a Christian. That's who I am. But we know that there's more than that, right? I mean, cultural Christians, they may know the lingo, hey, they may dress very conservatively, they may sing all the hymns and all the worship songs and know all the words, And even though they look like a duck and talk like a duck, they're not a duck. They're not a duck. Cultural faith cannot save you. Similarly, emotion-based faith, and I'm not saying we shouldn't be emotional, but emotional-based faith that bases its understanding of the reality of God based on an experience, based on a feeling that he gives them. You see, what happens with emotional faith, whenever that rush fades, whenever times of trial or heartache come around, all of a sudden, so does the commitment. Uh, It's all feelings without the engagement of intellect and both without action. Emotional faith, it, it likes to swim in the water like a duck, but it's not a duck. Intellectual faith On the other hand, man, it it seems really, really close to genuine faith. It knows all the scriptures, all the doctrine, all the essential statistics about God, and it mentally says, yes, all of that is true. I assent to that. I agree with those truths about God, and I enjoy thinking thoughts about Him. In fact, they probably think a lot of the right thoughts about God, but essentially, they're like a baseball fan of God. Right? They don't really know him. They know all the details, but they don't really know him having a real personal relationship with him. They know what a duck knows. They think like a duck, but again, they are not a duck. Okay, maybe ducks aren't the best analogy. It's not all it's quacked up to be. Sorry. Uh, but imagine, again, in another way, uh, if, if our faith were a body. Intellectual faith would be like a giant head with no legs or tiny little baby legs that barely work. Can't support the weight of it. Emotional faith would be like an enlarged heart, a huge chest cavity with a mushy, gushy heart inside that just loves everything and excited about every feeling and is so sensitive, um, but it has a tiny little head, right? Underdeveloped head, underdeveloped body, just a big heart. Whereas cultural faith is mostly just skin and bones, but it's other people's bones. It's built on other people. That's starting to get creepy. Okay. But you get my point. There's a disproportionate distortion of genuine faith. Each one of these are are just, they're close and they're kind of catching some of the image, but they're not reflecting the whole picture. 
Authentic faith, when it comes down to it, is saving faith. It knows the truth. It feels the deep passions of God. It seeks fellowship with others. And it has substance. It has dimension to it. And today we'll also see that authentic faith or saving faith proves its authenticity through deeds of service. Saving faith proves its authenticity through deeds of service. James has already been showing us some of the heart of true religion. That true religion endures trials and temptations. True religion listens, I mean truly listens and then obeys God's word. True religion cares for the widows and orphans. It doesn't show favoritism towards the rich and then neglect the needs of those who are poor and in need. It shows God's mercy to them. And it is active in its care for other people. That's one of the true demonstrations of true faith. Now, this passage that we're looking at today is one of the most theologically significant parts of the book of James, but it's also one of the most controversial parts of all time. Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., um, but Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer who initially brought us back to the solas, if you're familiar with the five solas, sola scriptura, sola Christo, sola, he, he brought us back to those essentials of the faith after he got into the book of Romans and started to see that uh, we are justified by faith alone, in grace alone, in Christ alone. That, it, that you can't get to it any other way. And he had issues with the book of James. In fact, he's legendary for calling this the straw epistle or epistle of straw because he felt there was a bit of a conflict between what Paul was teaching and what James was teaching. He's like, this doesn't seem to hold together. And yet, um, having studied Romans very recently and then reaching into this, we're going to see some similarities, right? We're going to see some some through lines for them. They're going to use some of the same language like faith, justification, works. But when they're talking about these things, we need to understand something. They're actually using them in a different connotation or a different meaning each time. And we need to see where they fit into the whole scheme of salvation because ultimately there is no real conflict in Scripture. There is no, no contradiction between Romans and James and, and Paul's writing. There is no difference. They are all Holy Scripture inspired by God. And if we believe that, then when it comes down to what James is saying, we'll understand even better that faith without deeds cannot save. That's what he's getting at. That's one of the bottom lines that I know you've probably heard many times before, but it's important for us to be reminded of again and again. See, there are other kinds of faith that I mentioned earlier on, or at least I don't know if you can officially call them true faith or real faith, um, and they can possibly lead to saving faith though they don't necessarily lead to it, right? All that intellectual development, all that emotional stuff, it can lead to real substantial faith in the long run. But you can also get stuck in those developmental stages as they might be, just kind of sitting there spinning your wheels, kind of like Lori was mentioning, like being out in a boat without a paddle. Have you ever been there where <laughs> all of a sudden you, you accidentally drop the paddle and it floats away from you and you have nothing but your paddles to kind of try and navigate in the water and you wind yourself up going in circles and circles and circles. That's, that's the last thing that James wants uh, any of us to do. <clears throat> he doesn't want us to waste our time on those. And so, in verse 14, in the very beginning of verse 14, and at the end of verse 16, he asks the exact same question. It's bookended. You know, that's, what they, that's the term that they call it in literary study. Kind of, it's bookended. At the beginning and at the end, same question. So that's a question that we need to be asking ourselves when we confront our convictions about faith, when we really look at who we are and what we believe about faith and deeds. Um, he asked the question, what good is it? What good is it? And this is a bit of a rhetorical question because down deep, everyone is supposed to know what the response is, right? What good is it? <laughs> it's no good. It's no good at all. But look at verse 14. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Now, pause for a moment on our gut answer on that. We, we kind of know 
the answer to that question. Can it save them? Hold on to that thought. I want you to take note of who it's addressed to first and foremost, because James is pretty different from a lot of biblical writers in this moment. In this moment, he's actually being gender inclusive. That's kind of a modern way of thinking about things. He includes brothers and sisters in this, and multiple times in this address, because he wants them to know that they're all included in this, that all people who are included in the body of Christ are valued by God. They matter, but even more so, in relation to our passage that we studied last weekend and even earlier on in chapter 1, we see that there are people that James is concerned about, the easily marginalized. Oftentimes, the women back in James' day were the most vulnerable people in all of society. James wrote long before women's lib when women had few rights and were treated as property and often couldn't own property themselves. It was a horrible injustice. I mean, think about this. If you were an unmarried woman and uh, your dad passes away and you have no more men in the family, you are left without property, essentially. You are left without a home, without security, unsure of what was going to happen next. Consider, too, uh, if you were married and then you became widowed, your husband dies, what will happen to you now? How are you going to care for your kids? They're incredibly vulnerable. And I believe that's why James includes them also here to remind us of that great thread, that through line that he's trying to get to that the church might look beyond the wealthy who we often favor and might look to the poor, those in need, those around us, and to actively care for them that we would show mercy because we have received mercy. So I want you to hold on to that, that through line, that thread that goes through this whole passage. It's important for us to understand, and it is there. It is absolutely there, as we'll see in just a little bit. But he asks, what good is it if you claim to believe in Jesus? You, you state that that is your profession of faith. It comes right out of your mouth. You say, I believe in Jesus, and I assume that I am born again, but... There are no works or deeds that follow it afterwards. Now, these works or deeds that he's talking about, it's really important for us to make this distinction. Remember how he said Paul uses works in one way and James uses works in another way? Well, they use the same Greek word, but at the same end, uh, what James is talking about are not pre-conversion works that people try and justify themselves with, build their whole relationship with God on, those religious observances, those rituals, those works of the law in keeping the law perfectly, like circumcision or uh, eating all uh, clean food and observing all the festivals and keeping every single commandment, just legalistically trying to do all those things so that they might earn their salvation. James is not talking about that. That's what Paul shoots down. That's what Paul says, that is not what saves you. And we know that to be true. It is by grace through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. And at the same end, James is saying, these are the works that are supposed to follow organically. They flow from your salvation. They are proof in the pudding, right? They're, you know, <laughs> they say the proof in the pudding is the eating. When you put it in your mouth, oh yeah, it is good. You realize that there is substance to it only after it has been made after it has been delivered to you. So these are deeds of grace and mercy. For those who've received mercy, they are the ones who communicate mercy. It's loving God and loving other people, looking after their physical needs and their spiritual needs. In fact, James gives the most clear illustration I think he probably could give in verse 15. He says, suppose a brother or sister, right, again, gender inclusive, is without clothes or daily food. Suppose that. I mean, this is a pitiable situation. The needy person is called a brother or sister. So for as far as we know, they probably are someone in the church, someone in the gathering, in the family of God, and they are without clothes and food. Now, hold on a minute, because um, even if they weren't in the church, it's important for us to note that this would be a cold reaction to them, what's about to be said to them. This is a cold, calloused interaction, but they are also not completely without clothes. He's not saying that they're showing up to church naked. 
That would be really weird. He's saying that essentially their clothes, their one outfit that they may have, their one good outfit that they may have, is still threadbare. It's still falling apart. It's still next to nothing. Right? But that's not the worst of it. Not only is there, are their clothes falling apart, is their outfit threadbare, but they're hungry. They're without food. I know, I know some people will buy their jeans pre-sliced, right? pre-ripped and, 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 and pre-destroyed, um, but these people are not doing that. They're not, they're not buying their clothes already worn out. They're legitimately worn out clothes. They're not trying to look distressed or look poor. I don't know why or that fashion trend necessarily came from the idea that you look cool if you look like you're poor. Um, but on the same end, uh, they don't have daily food. They're not like so many of us who are eating and grazing all day like hobbits, having our, our first breakfast, second breakfast, 11 season lunch, and you know, we keep having all of these meals all throughout the day. We have plenty of food at our fingertips at all times. These people potentially may go a day or two without anything in their belly. Can you imagine sitting next to them in church? Their clothes are threadbare. Their belly is grumbling because they haven't eaten in days. They're looking gaunt, and they're looking like, man, they just need something. That communion wafer, when it comes around, they're just like, oh, yeah. Uh, that communion wafer, right? That thing that dissolves in your mouth and it's gone. That's what they are excited about. They're in a desperate situation. And, and it's an obvious one that, that people can see all around them. And, and maybe you've gone to the city and maybe you have seen some people in this condition. And, and we generally associate it only with those in the city. But even within the city, sometimes these people are invisible just as well. Sometimes they're hiding away. I've, I've been uh, to Minneapolis on mission trips many times, and there's a lot of homeless people there. In fact, we stumbled one time when we were cleaning a park on a tent community in the woods of the park where some homeless people would go to find shelter. Can you imagine a Minneapolis winter in a tent in the woods? That would be unbelievable. But there are also those who are less obviously poor, but they're still essentially in the same boat. In fact, it's kind of ironic because sometimes um, people with very little money wind up spending it on status symbols so that they can look like everyone else. They may be wearing the latest shoes or they may be having the, the latest cell phone somehow that they f- were able to get in order to cover up their poverty, sort of an urban camouflage so they can kind of blend in and not be noticed. You know there are people like that, not just in cities, but there are those in our community, and you wouldn't know it if you were sitting right next to them right now. You wouldn't know how they're scraping by barely making it. And I think that's even more prevalent in our community now during COVID than any other time. But the problem here is, he's saying, suppose there's this person and you know their need. You've seen their need. It's completely obvious to you. And yet you decide to completely ignore them. That's what he's saying in verse 16. He says, if one of you, anybody, says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed. If any one of you does that, is that going to fix their situation? I mean, it's, it's nice words. It's a, it's a super spiritual sentiment. Go in peace. May the peace of God be with you. Shalom. Fare thee well, my friend. Yeah. You want them to fare well so long as it is not inconvenient or uncomfortable to you, as long as it costs you nothing. Wishing you peace, wishing someone peace does not actually do that, though. You know that? It doesn't actually impart peace to another person. It's a nice thing to say, but it doesn't do it. You know, when we say goodbye, do you know what that means? It originally came from God be with ye. God be with you. That was the wish, that God would go with you. So it's essentially very much saving the same thing. All right, goodbye. Hope you, hope you stay warm and, and eat well. When they have no way of doing so, no way of nourishing their own bodies, and that wish to them does not fill their bellies. It does not clothe their bodies. 
especially in the cold of night. It does not nourish even their souls. It sounds encouraging. It sounds friendly on the forefront, but it is a false front, right? It's a facade. So telling them to be well and warm fed, uh, well fed uh, is, is hollow. This is worthless religious talk. It does nothing to redeem the situation. It's such a passive response, and yet I think it's a common one today. Ultimately, it's a cover for an unloving heart that's saying, I deny any responsibility for this person. I have no debt of love to pay towards my brother or sister in Christ, which we know that is the one debt that remains outstanding, that you can never pay enough of as believers. We owe one another because Christ, of what Christ has done for us. We owe one another. James says in the second half of 16, that this hypothetical believer does nothing about their physical needs. He cares nothing, does nothing about them. And these simple needs are pretty easily met, right? I mean, you think about it. Most of us have a closet full of clothes that we never wear. Most of us have pantries stocked full of food that we can share. In fact, it's been said, I believe, uh, even Bono, the the lead singer of U2, which I don't know if you take him as a celebrity authority, (laughs) but he he said, if everybody in the world shared what they had, there would be no poverty. There probably is some truth to that. You know, it's, it's so much easier to look after those physical needs to do something about that. It's actually a lot more difficult to care for someone spiritually than physically. Yet, Even in caring for someone physically, we are doing a spiritual act in Jesus' name. It is a spiritual act. So James asks asks again, he says, okay, what good is it? What good is your faith? Is this actually saving faith? Is this real faith if it hasn't changed you? And even a hardened atheist would say, you know what? I don't think it is. That faith is no good. You say you believe in God, but your life isn't changed. You don't live like it. I remember reading an interview from Penn Gillette. He is uh, part of uh, Penn and Teller, the magic group. You may be familiar with them. Um, One of them doesn't say anything. The other one talks way too much. Uh, And they do amazing illusions. But he's an atheist, a hardened atheist. But one thing that he said was he said, I really truly respect a Christian who has the convictions that if I'm going to hell, they're going to warn me about it. They're going to care about that aspect of my life. They're going to love me enough to say something. And he says, I respect the depth of their convictions more than those who will never say a thing to me about it, who will never care about my soul. This faith without deeds is devoid of love. It's devoid of power. It's devoid of life. It is dead, just as James says in verse 17. He says, in the same way, faith itself, if it is not accompanied by action, that's another word for works, is dead. If it's not accompanied by action, it's dead. We know this to be true, right? Dead bodies don't really do much of anything, do they? (laughs) They can't. By nature, they cannot. And he's saying essentially such a profession of faith, it's dead on the ground where it lays. You spoke it and it just fell right to the ground because that's as far as your profession will carry you. It is loveless. And love is an active word. It is a verb, not a noun. It's not an adjective of of a feeling describing how we feel towards someone. It is something that we choose to do, to love another person. So he says, Faith without deeds is faith without love, and faith without love obviously is dead. It's like it has no blood flowing through it, no life within it. Though it claims to believe in God's mercy and loving kindness, it shows no mercy. In fact, it's very likely that it hasn't actually received the mercy of Christ. And we see this because it claims to believe in Jesus, but it doesn't live or love like he did. There's no transformation. There's no conversion of the heart. No no change that has happened. No 
compassion that has filled them and that drives them forward to love another person enough to do what is right by them, even when the need is obvious. Now, this illustration that he gives, it sounds like just a momentary thing, right? Where you pass by that panhandler on the side of the road that says, we'll work for food. Especially this happens a lot during the holiday season, doesn't it? You see them out by the mall or out there um, in front of stores just saying, I I we'll work for food. Uh, And I've done this again and again, and and my heart breaks. I remember uh, when we went to go visit my sister up in Traverse City when they lived way up there uh, some time ago. Um, we saw a guy out there, and he was standing there. Actually, he was pretty well dressed for winter, but he was standing out there with the sign, we'll work for food, and my heart broke. I couldn't imagine Thanksgiving going without food. I know there are many agencies that help people. We have a soup kitchen that, is, that does some great things in Benton Harbor, and we, we have some great missions that go around with our food pantry and other things like that, but can you imagine, though, of, of all times of year to go without food, to not have enough to take care of your family? That should fill our heart with compassion for this, these other people, these people in need. And, and so this lack of love indicates the condition of the heart of a person. James says, can that faith save? No, it can't. And so we need to ask ourselves this too. If my faith hasn't changed me, has it saved me? If my faith hasn't changed me at all, has it saved me? I know some of us grew up in church and we may not feel like we've changed that much. But Is God doing a work of building compassion in you? Authentic faith will inevitably be characterized by good deeds, by serving and loving another person. Because that's Jesus living through you, right? That's what he did when he came in the flesh. And now we carry carry out his mission. That's what we are saved for. And so our good deeds, our action, our faith in action is the litmus litmus test for our faith. It shows whether there's power in it or not. Is there life there or not? I wonder sometimes if we've made Christianity more about what we can get out of it than what we give back to God. What, we can, what God wants to do in and through us. Do we just wear the mask of religion to cover up our heartlessness? Our works prove our faith or they prove the lack thereof. we got to understand in our second point that faith and deeds are inseparable. They cannot be divorced from one another. Um, you know, one of the things that we always do whenever we're confronted uh, with our apparent inconsistencies on the inside, we get defensive. That's our natural reaction, isn't it? To immediately rush to justify ourselves and, and make a good argument. Hey, no, 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 that, that, that's not me, or, or that's not how things really are. I'm still good. I'm still as good as I think I am. And James anticipates this potential pushback, and and he offers kind of a, a model argument. He says in verse 18, But someone might say, You have faith, but I have deeds. And whoever this person is, this defense is under the illusion that faith and deeds can be two separate things, two separate ways to God, equally viable, equally mattering, like uh, your faith may be good and it it can lead to works like all that stuff like James is describing, and and you can have that. That's good for you, but I got deeds, you know, and it could be argued either way. Like I got this faith, which is more of an abstract idea of faith, right? Like I believe in God and that's all I, I, I need. I don't need anything else to demonstrate that it's real to me. I believe but he's saying you can't choose between those two options. It's not an either or. In fact, he says, show me your faith without deeds. Show it to me. Let me see. Where is it? Can you show it to me? Can you demonstrate it? Well, I believe all the right things, Pastor. I believe all this right stuff. Is that real faith, as we already said? Is that true faith? He says, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. I will demonstrate it to you. You'll see the fruit of righteousness in me. It'll come out. The New Living Translation, or sometimes paraphrase, um, says, I, can see your, I can't see your faith if you don't have good deeds. It's invisible. I can't see it. But faith, really, when it comes down to it, it makes itself visible. It's part of its nature. 
that full-hearted, loving trust in Jesus leads to a full-bodied obedience to Jesus. It's practical and real. It's the rubber meets road real. It walks like a duck. It talks like a duck. It acts like a duck because it is a duck. It is a genuine article. It does everything and is everything that it's supposed to be. And it's so much more than just an immaterial mental exercise. Sometimes I think we feel like church is that, right? Like we're just here exercising our brains, learning more details about God. But it's so much more than that. It's so much more than holding the right doctrine about God. The right doctrine is important. It is good. But it is not the same as full trust in who he is. In fact, James makes that abundantly clear in verse 19. He says, you believe that there is one God? Good. Or you're doing well, some translations might say. You're doing well if you believe that. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. Not quite the same as like uh, in The Lion King when um, Mufasa's name is mentioned and, and all of the, um, what are they? They're hyenas. All the hyenas, they shudder. They're like, Mufasa. Like, like a shudder like that. That's not what he's talking about here. This shuddering response of these demons who do know that God exists, they just decide to reject him. When they respond to the knowledge of God, they don't just a little quick shiver. They tremble involuntarily, uncontrollably, a violent shake of extreme fear because they know that for all that they know about God, they know he is holy, that he is righteous, that he's going to judge absolutely perfectly and that they are condemned and have no hope. They know all the facts about God. In fact, they probably know a lot more than some of us. They're aware of it. They've had a long time to learn and observe and see even face to face the very power of God. And yet, it doesn't lead to the right response. If you're saved, if you're truly saved and you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you've given your whole life and, and, and you're willing to follow him every day of your life, um, you don't have to shudder with that same fear. We should have a certain level of awe and wonder at the awesome holiness of God, amen? We should have that, that trembling in his power and his righteousness. We should have that deep concern for our loved ones who may go and meet him and may meet him and find out you did not trust him in Christ. You did not live for him and now here is what your eternal destiny is. In your sins you will die. We should tremble at that very fact of God's holy judgment, but we don't have to tremble in that fear knowing that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So again, he's saying, hey, you can be just like the demons. You can have all the right theology, but if it doesn't lead to the right response, it is empty. It cannot save. Milton once wrote that it is a good thing to possess accurate theology, but it is unsatisfactory unless good theology also possesses us. It's good to know all you can about God, but unless it changes you, it doesn't mean a thing. Unless now you have trusted him as your Lord and Savior and you're submitted to him, living for him, completely sold out to him, it raises the question, do you really know him? Do you really truly know him? Do you have a living relationship with him? You see, you can't separate faith from works. They go hand in hand. And, and he says in verse 20, he says that the foolish person or the empty-headed or the person who lacks understanding, he says, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless, that it is empty? In other words, uh, works alone don't work, uh, and workless faith doesn't work either. Well, he's going to share with us further evidences. He's like, okay, you want evidence? Here it is. Get ready, everybody. Here's evidence of two really well-trusted Old Testament examples. 
that are widely accepted by everybody as characters of great faith. Essentially, though, they're kind of at the opposite ends of the spectrum of people we might consider to be righteous. At, at, at the high end, we have our father Abraham. He says in verse 21, Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scriptures, and scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person consider, is considered righteous by what they do, not by faith alone. So again, this is not uh, the righteousness that comes before salvation, that, that of Christ wiping us clean. This is what is displayed afterwards. He says those two things in Father Abraham's life, faith and works, were working together throughout the whole of this. He was the father of the Jews. He was a wealthy, very moral male and a huge figure in history. Yet he was willing to obey God's command when it really didn't make a lot of sense. When God told him to take his son up the mountain to offer him as a living sacrifice all the way, what did he say to Isaac? He said, God will provide. He had faith that it, it wouldn't come down to that necessarily because he believed God's character was good. And it wouldn't come down to that, that and yet he still believed. I mean, imagine this huge sacrifice that he's being asked to make. This is the covenant promise in human form. This is Isaac, his child of promise, given to him by God in a time when it was basically impossible for him to have kids anymore. When his wife was barren, when there was no hope, he received a child of promise on whom all the covenant that was given to Abraham pretty much hangs, right? I'll make you great, and you'll be a great nation, and, and the whole world will be blessed through you. Well, how's that going to happen if you, you take Isaac's life? That's a huge question. And yet, he set out and he prepared to do so, and God did stop him in the last moment and demonstrated his amazing love by providing a scapegoat and an active illustration of what he has done in Christ Jesus for all who would believe. But in this moment, it made very little sense, and yet... This was proof of Abraham's spiritual state, his faith, his complete, absolute, abiding trust in God. He knew what God would do. He trusted God's character, and he was prepared yet to obey him completely. That is some big faith. And his faith, as I said, is inseparable from his obedience. They work together. Then on the other end of the spectrum, kind of the lowly person who we often kind of write off, and yet the Writer of Hebrews and, and throughout biblical history, for some reason, she's well-respected. Rahab, the prostitute. In fact, that's, that's how she's even described here. Rahab, the prostitute. Man, that's hard that your whole reputation be following you everywhere. That's what you are known as. Who is she? Rahab, the prostitute. Not Rahab, whatever her last name may be. All right? It says in verse 25, in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to spies and sent them off in a different direction? I believe he's mentioning the fact that she is Rahab the prostitute in order to say, hey, guess what? She is not the most moral character that you can think of in all of Scripture. In fact, she's kind of like the example sinner, the classic sinner. And yet, in the moment, because she feared God, she did what was right. And it's kind of a confusing ethical situation where she lied and yet in her lying did the right thing. It's hard to parse that out in some ways, but she saved some of the spies who were sent into Jericho to kind of investigate what was going on, what the lay of the land was. She saved them, including Joshua, and sent them back out. And uh, because of that, in their warning and in rescuing them, she too was spared from Jericho's destruction after Israel marched about. And she actually became part of Israel, which is even wilder to think about. And did you know that she is actually in the line of Jesus? That's what Matthew tells us. She's an ancestor of Jesus. She is in that. She's been brought into the body. So I don't know why we call her Rahab the prostitute, except to remember where she was when she was found. And yet, even in that, very basic, 
very simple faith of who God is, she obeyed. That faith led to a good work that saved lives. So we have these two kind of opposite ends of the spectrum, and he's saying, hey, all in between, it's the same. No matter how much you know or how uh, great you are or how lowly you are, it doesn't matter. Faith and deeds go together. They work together in that moment. And he reiterates that same thesis once again in verse 26. He says, what good is faith without works? As a body that is dead without the Spirit, so faith without deeds is dead. No vital signs. No clues to be found that your faith is alive. Because there's no movement. Faith moves you. Where there's no heartbeat, no breath, no movement, there's no life. It is just a corpse. Another way of looking at it as being dead is it is sterile. It is ineffective. It is unproductive. You know, we're called to multiply disciples. That's what Jesus called us to do, make disciples of all nations. And yet, if that faith never leads to that, then what good is it? You believe in God, that's great, that's great, yeah. You believe it's the best news ever, but... Nobody around you knows that you believe that. That kind of faith is is worthless. It reveals where we truly are and what we truly believe. You could say it really simply this way. A saved person serves. Saved people serve people. That's what we do. Because it flows out of us that love and compassion of Christ. Authentic faith doesn't just believe the right things about God, it does the right things. Saving faith proves its authenticity through deeds of service. That doesn't conflict with anything that Paul taught, with anything that we understand about God's grace and his mercy. It is true for you today, so where do you stand with him? Where is your faith? And how are you living it out? How will you live it out this week? I ask you that to to encourage you to ponder it, to think about it. Let's pray and ask God to open our eyes to the opportunities that surround us, of the needs of all the people in our community, in our neighborhood, in our families. Let's pray together. Lord, we believe in you not just as a mental exercise today, but we put our full, complete, absolute trust in you, in your character, in who you are and and what you have done and what you are yet to do. We trust in you. We also know that you are holy, that you are just, that you will judge all of mankind, and that one day we will all stand before you. And on that day, Lord, you will call us into account of what we have done for the least of these. And on that day, Lord Jesus, I pray that we will be able to give a good account, that when your books are open, there will be something written there that says, this person is a person of genuine faith. They have lived out what they say they believe. And Lord, if we have wandered from that, call us back again. Wake us up from within. Open our eyes to the opportunities around us that we might see and serve those who you have placed in our path in your name. And Lord, if we don't see them, I pray that we will not be, it will not be because that we're hiding from them or we're not closed off. I pray that we will go, as you called us to do, to go and make disciples of all nations, to lead them in your paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. We can't do this alone. We can't do any good work that you prepared for us in advance to do, even before the foundations of the earth, as it says in Ephesians. You prepared those good works for us to do, Lord. Help us to, to, to carry out your will here and now. Fill us with your love and your care for other people. Move us, God. Let your church arise. Let it be a church of action and not just words. A church who truly loves. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for demonstrating your love for us, not just in words, 
but in the ultimate sacrifice of you laying your life down for us. We love you, Jesus. It's in your holy name that we pray these things. Amen. Hey, just uh, want to remind you again, uh, don't forget to say hi to the Wurzels over here and get to know them a little bit, find out a little of their story. Um, but still social distance, wear your mask. Uh, but also don't forget to come on out tonight for our um, missions time with KT uh, out on the lawn out here. Bring your own lawn chair or blanket, whatever you want to sit on, and come on out for that good time. But right now, let's stand and receive this morning's benediction. Go as those who are saved by grace through faith and living it out day by day, demonstrating the work of love that Christ has done in your life to others. In his name and for his glory, we pray all these things. Amen. God bless you guys, and please have an awesome and safe week.